Coming up, I check out Softtech software. I play some games. Jeff plays around with the next. I read a book. Let's get on then. In the early days of the Spectrum, software companies seemed to spring up overnight and often vanish in a similar fashion. Some went on for years after, moving to other machines and consoles, and some slowly faded away. Others grew and became entities in their own right, and some got bought out by larger software houses. Softech seemed to have done a few of those things. I'll be working through the games in order they were advertised and the product codes on the packaging. They started with adverts around October 1982 with several titles. Meteoroids was a version of the arcade game Asteroids. The advert certainly hyped the game up, with things like machine code, synthesised sound effects that have left the other software houses wondering how we did it. Well, we'll soon find out if that's true. This is of course an early Asteroids clone, using filled graphics. Or maybe just several user-definable graphics stuck together. The movement is in character squares, and the amount of asteroids, sorry, meteoroids, on the first level makes it a tricky game. You can move, but it's not like the arcade, there's no inertia. You just move and stop, which is easier, but it does take something away from the game. Those machine code sound effects are just standard sound effects that are used in many, many early games. The other game was the Zolan Adventure, or Zolan the Adventure, depending on which advert you saw. This is a very basic text adventure, and I mean basic as in written in basic, and seemingly not even complete. The game has you looking for a fabulous treasure on the planet Zol X1, once belonging to Zolan. There is no indication of what this treasure is though. This is very roughly based on the colossal cave, including a hut, keys, water, a lamp, or in this game a torch, and a grate that needs unlocking. There are items in the game that are not even needed, or at least not needed to complete it. Watching the RZX, when you get the chest, presumably the treasure, and take it back to the house, nothing happens, no message or anything, and the game has nothing else to offer, looking through the basic listing. This game had no product code on the inlay like subsequent games, so it's assumed it came out at the same time as Meteoroids. The advert also mentions a game called The Quest as coming soon, and it never arrived, at least under that name. In November they put out two further adverts, a smaller half-page one and a larger full-page one. Let's start with the smaller one. There was a game called 3D Maze Venture, billed as a fast machine code game, being both a 3D maze game and adventure game in one. This game is missing in action but it may have been renamed by the company and released in March 1983 as Dragon's Lair. Both games are 3D maze adventure games. Sadly, Dragon's Lair is also missing, so we'll never know. On to the larger advert then, and we have mention of the compiler, promising to turn your basic games into machine code. I wonder why they never used it on Zolan. Softech produced a number of different compilers, but it doesn't mention which one this is. This advert also mentions some programming tools, ScreenKit and ToolKit. ScreenKit, offering machine code snippets to use in your own games, such as instant ink and paper changes, and ToolKit, which offers the basic programmer such utilities as a trace function. Both of these seem to have been renamed later as SoftKit 1 and SoftKit 2. Now we move into March 1983, and here we see a whole set of new games. And it's at this point SoftTech started to put product codes on their tape inlays. So in order of the product codes, we start with Firebirds, with the code SOF SUS001. And according to the inlay, this was part of the Ultima series. Anyone who has watched the show will know that I like this game, and it's a sort of version of Phoenix, but with a few differences. The first level has red birds. Destroying all of these, we'll move on to the next level, where the same red birds are there, along with a cyan alien. Destroying all the red birds again will take you to the next level, which adds large white things moving down the screen. 
and destroying all the birds again will take you onto the final screen which is a huge mothership that needs destroying. Gameplay and sound are nice and this is a great game. Next we come to Joust with the code of SOF SUS002, again part of the Ultima series. This is a version of the arcade game of the same name. You control an Ostron and have to destroy the Shadow Lords. You have to hit them from above to destroy them, and unlike the arcade version they don't drop eggs when destroyed, which is a shame. The graphics are okay and sound is adequate, but without those eggs it's less of a game. This game had a rapid name change, appearing with a new title but the same product code and inlay in August 83, now called Ostron. This is exactly the same game, and it can be assumed that there was a legal problem using Joust. Next game is Monsters in Hell with a product code of SOS SPG002, nearly the same product code as Joust and Ostron, and this time it's part of the Arcade Ace series. Maybe a run-in with Lord British for using the ultimate name caused the change, who knows. This is a version of the arcade game Space Panic, despite it saying on the inlay it's a version of Dig Dug. Here you run around the platforms, dig holes for the monsters to fall down, and build up a high score. Once you kill enough monsters, more monsters arrive, and the game just keeps on going. To keep your health up you have to collect the crosses. And that's about it really, nothing special, and nothing to make it stand out from many other games that are similar. Next comes Millipede, but this seems to have gone through a rapid name change as well, before the inlays were printed, as I can't find anything showing this title. It was renamed Megapede, with a code of SOS SPG003, part of the Arcade Ace series. This is a version of Millipede, or Centipede, you'll find out. Millipede in the arcades has more enemies like bees, earwigs, inchworms and ladybugs. But this seems to be just Centipede. It's not a bad version of the game though, with a variety of enemies and some nice sound effects. The graphics are small and moving character squares, but suit the game well. In this advert we also see Dragon's Lair, which has been mentioned earlier and is missing in action. There's also Cosmic Swarm, again missing in action. And Softsys, a set of tools for programmers that include ScreenKit and Toolkit, renamed to Softkit 1 and 2, along with a compiler, now given a name of Softcom and an assembler and disassembler. Around the middle of 1983, Softtech changed their adverts from mainly text-based to a new vibrant graphic rich affair and two new games. Robon, with a product code of SOF SPG004, part of the Arcade Ace series, and it's yet another arcade clone, this time Berserk. The intro to the game is good and very much like Robotron, but the game is definitely berserk. You move around in character squares and either shoot the robots or guide them into the walls. There is no exit on the levels like berserk in the arcade and once you have destroyed all of the robots the screen just scrolls left and a new one appears. The sound is very nice but control is a bit hit and miss. Not a bad game but just nothing special. And then came Repulsar, with the product code of SOF SPG005, and this was another arcade clone, this time of Missile Command. The sound effects were really nice in this game, but the mechanics of gameplay are way off. The arcade game gives you time to place your missiles, knowing that the resulting cloud will take a few seconds to expand and destroy anything that it hits. This game though, when you fire a missile, produces a small cloud that appears for about one second and then vanishes. So there's no feeling of fire and forget, which was great in the arcades. Here you get an instant explosion, which detracts from the overall gameplay I think. 
In May 1983, Softec clashed with Silversoft over the use of its compiler to create a game Slippery Sid. Softec were demanding royalties from Silversoft, and Silversoft were refusing, mainly because there was no mention of the royalties when purchasing the compiler, so they say, and the code generated by the compiler is a whole new entity, and not a creation of the compiler's author, who, in a strange twist of fate, was Andrew Glaister, who wrote Orbiter for Silversoft. Continuing on the journey then, in January 1984, and the next game to arrive is Microbot, and this game marked the start of a change for Softec. They were moving away from arcade clones, and also changed their logo, adding Masters of the Game, and also changing the product codes, removing the SOF part, with Microbot being just SPG6. The game sees you controlling Microbot, trying to repair androids. You have to collect coloured balls and fire them at the broken pipes to fix them. However, there are various bugs roaming around trying to break more pipes and generally get in the way. Certain balls repair certain pipes, so it's a bit like Psst by Ultimate Play the Game, really. The game isn't that bad, but there are parts where you are surrounded, and because you haven't completed the repairs in that screen, you can't move on, and all the bugs just move in on you and destroy you, and you lose a life. The game isn't bad, I suppose, but it could have been much better. The next game to come along was Starblitz, with a product code of SPG7, around February 1984. This took them back briefly to the arcades, with a really nice Defender clone. The graphics are large and smooth, and the whole game moves at an arcade speed. Control is crisp, and sound is good, and gameplay is excellent. This is really a good Defender clone, and certainly worth playing. If the sounds are not to your liking, Softwork did produce, on the same tape, a version that used the fuller sound unit. And here we get the same great gameplay, but now with different sounds. Next came Ugg with product code SPG8, also around February 1984. Nice music, but what about the game? Here you have to collect food from the top left of the screen and take it back to your cave at the bottom left. There is a wandering T-Rex that has to be avoided. You can throw a spear at it, but you only have one and it keeps regenerating anyway. And there's a flying thing, a pterodactyl, that drops rocks onto you, which have to be avoided as well. The main problem with the game is the control. To negotiate the paths, you have to be in the exact position before you can move up or down, and that's tight into the corner of the path, and this really gets annoying as you play. More often than not, you get trapped on a path because you can't get out of the corner, and this is very frustrating. The game has some nice sound effects though, but the control just lets it down. It's sad then that this was the last game for Softec, at least as the original company. They did wander into the non-games market during this period, with their development tools, as already mentioned, plus a few compilers. In 1982, they'd released their integer compiler and their Super C compiler, and in 1983, their floating point compiler and another version of their integer compiler. These were covered in episode 110. They also branched out into business with Spectral Writer, a word processor released on Wafer for the Wafer Drive. In late 1984, Softec went through a huge reshuffle and renamed themselves The Edge. The Edge released a lot of software, including Brian Bloodaxe. Darius Plus and Fairlight. Softec International was then split into multiple smaller divisions, focusing on separate styles of product. A software that produced Alien Syndrome, Soldiers of Light and Executor. Soft Technics that gave us the artist 1 and 2, the writer and page maker. And Micro Selection, who produced budget versions of their old titles from all their subsidiaries. 
And that was the end of Softec as a standalone company. Softec and Softec International, though, produced these early games with some great artwork. The changing company is reflected in these, from the early inlays through the Ultima series and Arcade Ace series and Masters of the Game. Not a bad collection of mainly arcade ports. One more thing to mention, though, Firebirds was also released on Flexidisc by Computer Gamer magazine in December 1985 under the name of Xpec. Same game, same author, different title. And that is the end of the soft tech story. platform game published by Sega in 1986. It saw Wonder Boy set off to rescue his girlfriend. The cute graphics and jolly tune made it approachable and the gameplay was smooth and accessible. In 1987 Activision released the game for the Spectrum to mix results and reviews. The game is in monochrome and follows the same style as the arcade game, a horizontally scrolling landscape with various things to avoid or collect. Your health slowly reduces as time goes on, so you have to keep collecting the fruit that can be found abundantly scattered about. Eggs can also be found, and breaking these will give Wonderboy one of several things. Initially it will be a stone hatchet that he can throw to get rid of things like snails, frogs and snakes. Subsequent ones can have a skateboard so it can move faster, and later ones you get a fairy that gives you immunity. They can also contain bad things like mushrooms as well, so be careful. The landscape, although detailed, mostly scrolls in jumps, which is in stark contrast to the smooth scrolling arcade experience. The characters are all there, although some animation frames are missing, for example the skateboard sprite. In the arcade he waves his arms about and does wheelies. Here though, not much happens. The sound is okay, but the music is not quite right and seems to be missing a few notes, when compared to the original at least, and the sound effects are nice and work well. Control will take a few attempts to get to grips with, but once you do you should enjoy a decent game. Wonderboy can jump higher if he's moving, so high up items need to be collected whilst running. It also appears, although it might not be, that he can't jump as high on a skateboard, maybe it's just me. There are things that he can't destroy like rocks, so these have to be jumped over, and later we get moving platforms to negotiate as well. The gameplay feels restricted, the stuttering of the scrolling doesn't help, and it's certainly slower than the arcade version. Because of the ever decreasing energy, you have to keep moving, and this adds extra urgency to each stage. Because the game and subsequent RZX playbacks are denied for distribution, to show you further levels and stages I had to cheat, and downloaded the poke file, to get a bit further. Although I had infinite lives and infinite axes, it was almost impossible at times. Some of the jumps had to be pixel perfect, and it took me about 30 minutes just to get past the second stage. There's no need for this rapid change in difficulty, and I couldn't get past this point for what seemed like an eternity. Until I discovered that pressing fire at the same time as jump allows you to jump higher. Well that's obvious isn't it? As an arcade conversion then, it's just about passable I think, and yes it's a million miles from what the Spectrum was doing in the early 80s, but it could have been so much better. Smoother scrolling, even if it did mean a reduced height plane area, and controls that felt better. And maybe even some colour here and there, and definitely a bit easier. If you like the arcade game, stick to that. If you've never played the arcade game, you might enjoy this. 
at least until you get to the harder stages, when it becomes so frustrating that you just want to stop. This is Do Not Pass Go, released by Workforce in 1982. From the title, I think you know what it's going to be, and from the year, I think you may get an idea of the quality it could be. The board is drawn, sort of, and you can have up to six players playing at the same time, if you can find that many friends, of course. Now, if someone could make this multiplayer across the internet, then it would be cool, but it isn't. Once you choose the number of players, and you don't even get a chance to enter their names or anything, the dice starts to roll, and it's time to play. There's no movement, though, and the player marker that you didn't get a chance to choose just appears at the landing point. When you get to a square, you can buy it if it's not already taken, which obviously takes some of your money. As you take turns, each player's stats are shown along with the position. You keep pressing enter, you keep rolling the dice, and you keep reading the results. There are options down the side to show you things like what the player owns and mortgages and that sort of thing, but sadly you can crash the game. Simply select H for houses, and then enter zero. Ah yes, the game is written in basic. Here's the listing. Anyway, back to the game then, and there's nothing special here. You just keep hitting enter, followed by yes or no. You can build houses and things like that, and you do get community chest and chances, and you can also land on jail and have to throw a double to get out. Overall, it's an early basic game then, and I can't even say give it a try because I wouldn't recommend it. This is Sinclair 1 The Trial Begins, released in 2021 by Sequentia Software. Now this is a nice little game, or should I say book, or should I say play as you go, anyway, make of it what you will. Using a series of multiple choice options, you work your way through the story, interacting with things and slowly working out the best way to complete it. The graphics are really nice, and the text descriptions, although converted to English, are sometimes a little tricky to follow. You will go down many dead ends with this, and so you need some time to sit and really enjoy it, trying every option to see what works and eventually making progress. This is something different, not a platform game or an arcade game. It's a nice, slow, easy, multiple choice game that can be quite calming to play. The game is short, but enjoyable, because of its content, and its story. An interesting diversion then, definitely worth a play. Hello! A while ago on Facebook I saw a post with some Spectrum Next Basic that looked a little bit like this. When it was run, it did something that looked like this. So let's have a look at that basic code and see what it does. Run at 3 runs the Spectrum Next at 28 MHz. Then Line 10 changes the directory to be a backgrounds directory. The browse command then opens the Spectrum Next browser in that directory looking for layer 2 images. Then line 30 selects layer 2, makes it visible, and loads in the layer 2 in image that was selected. Then layer 2 is set below the ULA and sprites are above the ULA. Then we change the directory again to games. Line 50 opens the browser again, but this time looking for Spectrum games with the extension Z80. And line 60 
sets the speed back to the 3.5 Hz of the normal spectrum and uses the spectrum command to launch the game. Those last two lines are just ones I added to save the basic code. And essentially the reason why this works is that layer 2 is actually stored in the FPGA and the spectrum next in hardware. So when you load a layer 2 image it stays there. I did try this on the command line and it didn't work so you need to do it all in one basic script but other than that it works quite nicely. This thing got me thinking, what else could you do with this? My immediate thought was, can I get something in the border? Layer 2 doesn't go in the border, but sprites do. So I loaded up the Remysharp tools that I'd discussed in last month's show and thought it would be good if you could have Jetman watching you play Jetpack. I got an image of Jetman, used my Jetman book from Chris Wilkinson and spent a long time creating six sprites that would have Jetman watching you as you played. And this is what I got. Now that was okay. So I thought, can I get more? Can I create an ultimate play the game logo in sprites? After a little try, I gave up on that and instead wrote a Python script that would take an image of a ultimate play the game logo and turn that into sprites. And this is the result I got. That looks a lot better. Then I thought, what other games would I like to do this with? And it being me, my immediate thought went to The Lords of Midnight. I already had my tool for taking images and converting them to sprites. So I got to work scanning in my Lords of Midnight box art and seeing what I could do. One thing I will say is that the reason it works, and you can see the layer 2 behind the background of the game, is because in the ULA, black is transparent. Now with Lords of Midnight, it uses black for quite a few things. Horses, for example. If you load a layer 2 image in, you can have some unexpected results. I did try a layer 2 of the map behind the day-night screen, which worked well until it got to nice where the ground becomes black and the trees become black or you encounter some horses or use one of the select screens to look at the horses. So you do need to be careful when doing this. But I was rather pleased with my end result for Lords of Midnight, as you can see. So that's something interesting and different you can do with your Spectrum next for jazzing up old Spectrum games. I had a load of fun playing with this. I think it's well worth investigating what you could do. A big thank goes to Dave Clark, who it was, made the original post on Facebook. Thank you, Dave. That was a great idea, and I had a lot of fun playing with it. So until next time, happy gaming. This is Florence Hall of ZX Spectrum Games, a book that I was given by Jeff a few months ago, and I've only just got round to reading it. It's very high quality material. The cover is hard and glossy. The pages are thick and glossy. The author is... no, best not say it. Anyway, the book is split into sections, covering a variety of different games. For example, there's the Arcade Conversions section, and here we get such games as Operation Wolf, Robocop and Commando, with descriptive and light-hearted text accompanied by great pictures. After this we get to the gratuitous Willy section, I'm sure Jeff would like this part, covering some of the games featuring the little minor chap. Then there's the hard section, and here we get a collection of games that are hard to play, and I agree with most of them. Airwolf, yes. Halls of the Things. Yes, yeah, not enough fingers in the world for that one. Luna Jetman, of course, I could never play that. And more. Then there's the Daily Thompson section. Here we get a collection of games, all featuring the man himself, and going into each event individually. Then we get the cunningly named Some Other Games section, which includes 
you guessed it, some other games. Batman, 3D Star Strike, Fred. Ah, yes, a lot of favourites here. This is the largest section of the book, and most of the games I can definitely identify with. Apart from Fighting Warrior, I think that's a terrible game. And the last section is the ultimate section, of course, and here we get coverage of some of the ultimate play the game, games, games, game, games, yes. Overall, this is a nice book. High quality materials, and something different to read. It's not just game reviews. It includes personal memories, jokes, and asides. Grab a copy if you can. Thank you.